invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15 to 25. 3, verse 15 to 25. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer comes by promise. But God himself, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and, has, and was put in place through angels by an intermediary, now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, so we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God, through faith. For as many as you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for these words you've given to us to speak to us. Lord, now as we look to your word to study it, as we seek to honor you as we study it, we ask you, O oh God, to open our eyes to see you to see and have understanding. Open our ears to hear from you. Give us courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I remember our wedding day when Sherry and I got married. And as we were sharing our vows there's one point in this, the vows where, in the vows it was to talk about to serving, the, for me to serve my wife. And for some reason, I blocked out for a moment there and completely missed what the pastor was reading to me to, to say. And I, instead of saying to serve, I said to love my wife. Well, even though I said love, an aspect of that has to do with service. The point I'm making in sharing this illustration with you this morning is the point of when my wife and I made vows to each other, it was a covenant together. My wife and I were covenanting in relationship together. Just like any husband and wife, when they say those vows between the, them, each other, they are making a covenant with each other to promises they are making to each other to fulfill through the life of their marriage till as sometimes some vows say, till death do us part. 
in our passage this morning, it's talking again about the law, but it's also bringing it about the covenant and the purpose of the law and the covenant. How do they relate together? Or do they differ? What's the point of both of these? Well, as we'll see through this Sunday and next Sunday, we'll see that there's a very key important things about the covenant and the law. We've been talking about the law the last couple of Sundays quite a bit. But again, as a means to understand what the law is and the purpose of it. So we understand rightly of how we're saved. Again, not because of the law, but because of the grace that God has given us. So this morning we're going to look at two points this morning. Look based on this passage this morning. The first is this. The covenant is ratified. The covenant is ratified. This comes from verse 15 through 18. And in here, Paul is talking about Abraham and a covenant that God made with Abraham that they started to see come to fruition a bit 430 years after. And that's when the law was given to the Jewish people. In verse 15 again, it says here, To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Again, a marriage is a good example of that, a marriage covenant. That is something that, it's not, marriage isn't God, man-made, it's God-made, but the vows between the husband and the wife are promises that they've made together. And that covenant is to not be annulled. After all, what God has placed together, man is not to take apart. But also, no one is to add to what covenant has been made. It's been when it's been ratified. And we see throughout Scripture, there's many covenants that God makes that has to do with what God puts into place. God is the one who ratifies it. And man cannot annul it. In this passage specifically is the example of Abraham, the covenant God made with Abraham. Remember the covenant? That through him all nations would be blessed. And also through him there will be many peoples and nations that would come to be. These are promises that God made. And when God makes a covenant, when God makes a promise, he fulfills it always. Now some covenants God makes as a means between God and people. And maybe there's a side that the people need to fulfill in order for the covenant to be fulfilled too. In that case, when people break that covenant with God, then God is no longer held to hold that covenant that that promise he's made. But there are many covenants that God has made that are unconditional, like the one that God gave Abraham. That through Abraham, again, God will make a great nation, or great nations. And through him, all nations would be blessed. It's kind of like the covenant God has made with us through the cross. A covenant that God has ratified, that no one can take from it or add to it. We do hear those that do come up with false gospels. And we're reminded to be careful of that. Paul has talked about that already in Galatians. Don't listen to those who are giving a false gospel. Only listen to those who are giving the true gospel. Because we cannot add to that promise or take away from it. God has established this covenant. So the covenant is ratified because God ratifies it. Two, the law reveals transgression. We see this from verse 19 and verse 20 as it says, Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one. But God is one. The point of the law that we've seen the last couple of weeks again is, again, it's not the way to attain salvation. We can't do any enough good works on our own to attain salvation. It's not by works as Paul writes elsewhere. It's only 
through what Christ has done. But again, the point of the law reveals our transgressions. Well, what does this word transgressions mean? Well, it's the Greek word parabias, which means act of deviating from an established boundary or norm. In another word, overstepping. Um, think of sometimes when someone has overstepped the bounds of their authority that they have. Sometimes we hear that phrase of stay in your lane, right? <laughs> With different types of authority, there are certain lanes that that authority has and one needs to stay in those. Same is true with this when it comes to transgressions. That's when we have stepped out of our bounds that God has given us. God has given us boundaries, not to spoil our fun, but to protect us from the evil that coming out of those boundaries causes. The hurt and pain and suffering that sin causes. So God gives us the law to know what the boundaries are. But also, because it reminds us that we need the covenant with God, the covenant that he has made at the cross. There are some, though, that say, and as it even says too, is the law now then contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. Paul is correct in saying this. God's promises, the law does not con, is not contrary to God's promises, but actually is in a way of showing the fulfillment of the promises that God gives us. It reminds us to point back to him, to come back to Christ. It reminds us, because of our transgressions, we need Jesus to save us from our sins. In verse 22, it says, too, that the law or the scripture, instead of giving life, again, here's the words of verse 22. But the scripture implies everything under sin, so that the purpose by faith in Jesus Christ, Christ might be given to those who believe. The scriptures Paul is describing and relating to here has to do with the Old Testament Torah, the law that God gave the Jewish people. And the point, of, again, of the Old Testament law was to point us, to remind us of our transgressions. Think about the Old Testament system and, and all the old laws that, that the Jews had to fulfill all the time. Uh, I can remember, I was in one class in Bible college and seminary that talked about this. There was something like over 600 laws that the Jewish people had to fulfill. And part of that too is when they sinned, they'd have to go to the temple with a sacrifice. God's word would describe what kind of sacrifice they had to do called a sin offering. And they would have to put that on the altar as a burnt offering to the Lord for forgiveness of their sins. And once a year, the priest would do that on the altar as well too, a, a, an offering, a sin offering for the entire nation of Israel. I could imagine, I think about our day and age too, and even just as us as Christians, think about how many times we sin and how many sacrifices we'd have to do then for each of those sins. That's a lot of sacrifices. Thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore because Jesus was the per perfect sacrifice for us. But again, Paul's reminding us of the old covenant here, the old the law. It reminds us the purpose of that law is to remind us that we are sinners in need of God's grace. So the law reveals transgression. There's more that we can say to this, and we'll, we're going to stop at that point here. And next Sunday, we're going to look at the third point based on this passage here. But may we remember that Christ, that God has ratified a covenant that he has made for us at the cross. And the law, the point of the law is to remind us that we're transgressor, transgressors and that we need Jesus to save us from our sins. Yesterday, I was going to get, um, get our propane bottle filled. And I was talking with the gentleman who's filling up our propane bottle. It's interesting because he talked about this day and age, what things are going on and 
and had mentioned about, oh man, wonder what it's going to be like after this life. What happens after this life? And God put it on upon my heart to share with him. And so I asked him, you know, there's a way to know for sure what happens to you after you die. Would you like to know? And the gentleman was kind of hesitant and said, yes. So I was able to share the gospel and actually found out that he was a believer. But it's a reminder, though, sometimes we do have doubts in our faith. But when we do, come back to God's Word and be reminded that Jesus paid the price for us. That if we come to faith in Him, that we have assurance of our salvation, that we have our eternity in heaven with God. So then we don't need to worry about our transgressions anymore. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about eternity because our eternity is destined for heaven. We can know and have peace. The hope, not hope that we're hoping something will happen, but hope that is fulfilled and revealed in what Christ has done for us. The promise, the covenant that God has made with us at the cross. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for these words that you've given to us. These words that remind us that your law points us that we are sinners in need of your salvation. Lord, we thank you too that you also fulfill your promise in the covenant at the cross of dying in our place for our sins. Father God, it's so good to know that you fulfilled that promise to Abraham when you came and died on that cross. All nations are now then blessed because of your gift of salvation. So we give you thanks, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that when we have come to faith in you, we are no longer sinners, but you dress us with your holiness and your righteousness. You call us saints. So Lord, may we live that way as saints. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you.